Well, this came pretty quick. The Turks are apparently going to make good on their uh, uh, threat to uh, defend the government of national court in Libya from uh, General Khalifa Haftar's ongoing assault on Tripoli that's been, uh, well, been raging for most of this year. Here we are at the end of 2019, and uh, old uh, Khalifa Haftar has yet uh, to close the deal in Tripoli. He has not been able to, t to uh, take the city. And uh, now uh, his, uh, his foes, the, uh, the GNA, are calling in the cavalry. Turkish troops now, since the first time, for the first time since the fall of the Ottoman Empire, uh, will be setting foot uh, in, uh, on the shores of Tripoli. And they are coming this time uh, not as conquerors, but as liberators, supposedly. It's kind of funny. The Turks now seem to be learning uh, from the, uh, the American model of imperialism. Don't come as a conqueror. Call yourself a liberator. Uh, because if you say that enough, uh, you know, it'll be welcome as, uh, you know, it'll be considered true. Now, of course, in the Turks' case, yes, there are the people, they are being invited in. By the government in Tripoli, so it's not you know it's not like you know the, when the U.S. invaded Iraq or anything like that. Um, it's not quite that uh, hypocritical or nonsensical. But it's very clear that what Erdogan is trying to do here is to uh, spread Turkish influence. He has a great interest uh, in trying to defend the government in Tripoli. And so uh, we're supposed to expect these troops sometime in January, and just after the New Year on January 8th or 9th. Um, Erdogan said that uh, he expects the parliament will uh, approve uh, the deployment, which is kind of funny. I guess in, in Turkey, the, you know, we're, we're told that Erdogan's this big dictator and that, oh my god, the presidency in Turkey now has so much power ever since that constitutional um, amendment that they passed a few years ago. And Erdogan's now basically a dictator. Well, look, he still has to go to parliament to deploy troops to, uh, to start a new war. Uh, the U.S. president doesn't have to do that. I mean, I look at this and I go, wow, it, <laughs> he can't even start a war by himself? That, this guy has no power. But anyway, that's a, that's a bit of a sidebar. Uh, back, to, uh, back to Libya. And why this is, I, I think, uh, so much in, uh, in Erdogan's interest is that um, Erdogan, something that doesn't get talked about too much, I don't think, in Western media, is that is Erdogan's sort of uh, neo-imperial ambitions. Uh, he very much, you know, kind of like Putin, wants to restore the glory, the former glory of his country, um, and to have it be once again uh, recognized as an independent power. They ha they like, um, you know, they like this idea of uh, 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 what was the uh, multipolarity? That's the term. To where you have uh, multiple, uh, you know, powerful countries. Uh, that dominate over other countries, and not just say, let's oh, one global superpower like the so like the United States. Uh, you know, in the current order, or uh, Turkey would be seen as one of the many, many, many vassals of the United States. You know, it is a NATO country. Erdogan, however, is not content simply sharing some of the United States' power. He wants to build up his own base of power. And so the way he's been trying to do that in the past few years uh, is that, uh, you know, in the years of the Arab Spring, supporting uh, politicians uh, who were uh, going to come up, you know, through the Arab Spring uh, and in opposition uh, to the, uh, the Arab dictators – uh, who aligned with Erdogan's ideology and uh, were members generally of some Muslim Brotherhood-affiliated party. Now, I think that uh, the focus in the United States on the Muslim Brotherhood I th is largely based on the name because it sounds very scary. And they go like, oh my gosh, these are these bad radical Muslims or whatever. And, and they are, you know, they are conservatives, certainly. But I mean, they're suit and tie wearing guys have gone over this in the past. But the, the thing that's notable about them is not so much their religious beliefs, but that uh, really all of them kind of um, are – well, more or less tied to Turkey. So you need to look at a Muslim Brotherhood government, the prospect of a Muslim Brotherhood government um, in any country, not so much as the rise of uh, you know, political conservatism uh, but, or of religious conservatism, uh, but as the, the rise of uh, Turkish influence. Because all these governments, well, yes, domestically, they will have you know, fairly conservative um, orientations. On, uh, when it comes to foreign policy, they will be uh, pretty much in line with uh, the Turks and Erdogan. And so that's uh, you know, why in, uh, in so many other countries, uh, the, uh, the powers that be, um, the established powers in places like Syria 
or Yemen, or uh, uh, Egypt, forgive me, I'm hesitating a lot this morning, uh, they uh, worked very hard to overthrow the Muslim Brotherhood, not because they were afraid of these radical you know, Sunni jihadists or something, uh, because the, the Brotherhood are very different from those guys. These are not, you know, bin Laden, uh, you know, al-Qaeda types. They were afraid of Turkish influence in their country. At least that's the way I viewed it. Uh, that is why you see people like Assad and the Saudi royal family, people who you know generally don't get along very well, both opposing the Muslim Brotherhood. I think to them the Brotherhood more represents Turkish influence over Arab peoples. And now I may be wrong about that, and perhaps the, the Arabs don't see it that way, but I know for a fact that based on his actions that Erdogan certainly does see it that way because he has backed every Muslim Brotherhood party um, in Syria, uh, Egypt, where they, they had some success. Egypt, they actually won the election and then were overthrown, and so Egypt pretty much is, is on a very confrontational uh, stance uh, when it comes to Turkey. And of course, Tur um, uh, Haftar is uh, being backed by Egypt. This is not a coincidence. Haftar is very similar. He's a very similar character to Sisi. You know, he's trying to overthrow this uh, Brotherhood-led government in Tripoli. Of course, Haftar controls, uh, you know, pretty much all of Libya, uh, less Tripoli as it is. But for symbolic reasons, the capital is uh, is very important. Even though, it, frankly, this is getting a bit off topic, but I think it, things would be just fine if perhaps they decide to settle their differences and Haftar said, "Fine, you can have Tripoli. I will keep the rest of the country. I'll keep all the oil and everything. I'll be. I'm just hap fine setting up my capital in Benghazi, and you know we can be. Uh, I don't know the state of." Uh, greater Libya, and you can be the state of lesser Libya, or you know, you can call it uh, uh, Libya inferior and Libya superior, or something like that. Sort of a Gross Deutschreich uh, versus uh, Klein Deutschreich uh, sort of dynamic here. But you know, that doesn't seem to be a possibility here uh, either. Uh, the uh, the Tripoli government conquers all of Libya, which again looks very unlikely, or uh, Haftar. You know, eventually uh, will retake Tripoli, or perhaps he will tire himself out trying to take Tripoli uh, to the point to where he can't hold on to the rest of the country and it breaks again into anarchy. Because it looks to me, now that the Turkish troops are going to be uh, deployed to Tripoli, I don't think that Haftar will be able to retake the city. I think that uh, Erdogan will send just enough, however much is necessary, uh, to hold Tripoli. Uh, to make sure that uh, he's able to maintain – that he's able – first of all, it, it sends a very important message to other uh, you know, Muslim Brotherhood types all around uh, the, uh, the Arab world to see that Erdogan is not abandoning these guys in Tripoli, to see that Erdogan is – a viable international partner that you can uh, be a successful, you know, that he is a, that they're a good um, empire and that you can be a good satellite. Every satellite needs a strong state, uh, you know, above them to protect them and to, you know, patronize them. And so even if it's all in vain, I think Erdogan here is doing a good job uh, trying to demonstrate. Uh, the uh, the goodwill of Turkey in that sense. So back to the battle uh, battle itself. Uh, in Tripoli, uh, Haftar, once uh, once this deal with Turkey was signed, tried very quickly to, to make a new push to try and retake the city once and for all and, and hopefully depose them before the Turks ever got there. Um, however, uh, things don't seem to have progressed too much uh, since they started that new offensive at the beginning of the month. Uh, Haftar, last week I think it was, uh, ordered – uh, the, uh, the the Misrata militia, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, partners of the GNA government, uh, to uh, desert their posts or uh, face the wrath of uh, Libya's uh, national army, which is Haftar's group, uh, attacking their hometown of Misrata. And I at the time said, well, you know, if I were one of them, I'd be pretty worried about that because, uh, you know, if here I am defending Tripoli um, – I don't really live in Tripoli. I don't care about them. I'd care much more about my own town. And if the, you know, Haftar says, okay, we're either going to destroy your hometown or we're going to retake uh, Tripoli, I'd say screw Tripoli. You know, because these guys, they're just a militia. They're not a, um, or you know, they're an independent militia that happens to be affiliated now with the GNA. They are not folks who are super loyal ideologically, I don't think, uh, to the GNA. 
And so if this was a credible threat, I thought it was a, it, it might be a pretty effective uh, way of uh, getting these guys out and, and to, you know, once they were aside, it would have been much easier for Haftar to march through Tripoli and, and, uh, you know, kick the, kick the, uh, the GNA out of, uh, whatever it is, the building that they're meeting in. But as it turns out, the Misrata militia did not heed, uh, the warnings of Haftar. They have not deserted their posts. They are still defending Tripoli. And, uh, from all accounts that I've seen, and it's kind of tough to get news in and out of Libya, uh, but I haven't heard of any um, wrath uh, being unleashed on Misrat. I haven't heard of the uh, the LNA sending uh, you know planes to go bomb the city. So it seems as though uh, Haftar's uh, tough talk was just that, uh, an empty threat. And so if uh, you know this one last push uh, is not even enough for them to uh, to uh, retake the city. Uh, without the Turks there. Once the Turks arrive, I think it'll be uh, pretty certain that uh, Tripoli will not fall anytime soon. And so then the question will become, well, how far does, uh, does Erdogan want to take this? Is he going to be satisfied just defending Tripoli and, ma- and keeping uh, the, uh, the last vestige of the Muslim Brotherhood on earth, uh, their last uh, sort of bit of soil that they control uh, from falling? Or is he going to try and push for a full-scale war to retake all of Libya from Haftar? You know, because keep in mind, while Libya is very, very big, um, the uh, the country is pretty sparsely populated because it's you know there's so much desert. So if you attack the uh, the densely populated areas, well, then uh, it shouldn't be it shouldn't take too much effort uh, for a an advanced NATO army uh, like Turkey's. Uh, to actually conquer Libya. Of course, if that were to happen, uh, you would see, uh, for the you know for the first time in, in quite a while, something you know we don't get too much of, and that is a conventional war between uh, two armies. These would not be professional soldiers uh, versus uh, you know armed jihadis uh, with uh, with AKs you know waving them over their head. Uh, these would be you know pr- professional soldiers on both sides, which would make for quite the interesting show. So it would be interesting at that point whether uh, Haftar's allies, uh, Russia, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, um, all those countries, the uh, the countries that don't like the Brotherhood. Uh, well, I, I don't know about Russia. Russia, I'm not exactly sure what their uh, what their deal with Haftar is. Probably maybe something oil related. But it would be interesting if those countries uh, just let uh, the Turks try and take on Haftar all by themselves, or if perhaps uh, you would see Egypt maybe. Uh, their next door neighbor jump in and join the fight to try and help uh, Haftar's army. Then you would have a, a very interesting predicament to where uh, you would have a, a NATO ally uh, engaged in war with a, uh, a non-NATO U.S. ally being Egypt. And I think it's pretty clear right now that uh, the United States considers Egypt, even though they're not in NATO, to be a much closer ally than Turkey. But any of that, that's a that's a long way away for now. I, uh, I'm still not uh, in t- I'm still not sure that uh, that Erdogan would try and retake all of Libya. But uh, I think it would be quite tempting for him once he has a foothold, because right now what they're all link- what they're going to do is establish a base uh, in Tripoli. Uh, he will have Turkish troops in Tripoli, uh, and so the city will not fall. And so once that situation stabilizes a bit, perhaps once. Uh, if maybe Haftar gives up there, if he starts to show a bit of uh, uh, weakness or if he relents, uh, well, then uh, that would be when I would expect to see Erdogan to, to make his next move. So if you gained anything of value out of this video, I'd appreciate you clicking that like button and sharing this video. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe because I do upload every day and I'd hate to have you miss one. So I'll see you folks back here tomorrow.